So it is a treat and a thrill to introduce today's speakers. And to put this in context, the residents have the four-year leadership training program. And the, one of the years is population health and prevention. And historically, that's been kind of abstract. That's kind of like, you know, epidemiologists or public health people might do that stuff. You know, we're, we're surgeons. It got more relevant a couple of years with the pandemic. And in our specialty, we have the issues of loss of taste, smell, uh, intubation injuries, and people who can't even come in. So their, their, their conditions get worse. But today, it's going to get really relevant because we're talking about two different types of cancer that affect wide swaths of the population. And from the surgical perspective, how do you know when to treat or is your treatment worse than the condition itself? So we could unintentionally with, with the best I, you know, concepts of trying to help the patient, we could unintentionally be harming patients, a wide swath of patients. And our speakers today actually um, focus on this. They're actually NIH funded to study this. So it is really relevant for surgeons in population health and prevention. I'll introduce both speakers as mentee and mentor. So David Francis has an MD and MS. He's currently an associate professor with tenure at the University of Wisconsin. Now in his training, he went to medical school at the University of Rochester in New York, but he spent time at the Dartmouth Institute. And they study things there because many people would have heard of it about why is it the incidence of tonsillectomy in one state, Vermont, compared to New Hampshire, which is right next door, several times greater. You know, is it because there's more need for tonsillectomy in one state or are they under treating it in the other state? So David got his, his epidemiological chops there. Went to the University of Washington and it was on a T32 so he could do studies. And then we were fortunate to be able to recruit him, Dr. Garrett and Dr. Ossoff, to be a fellow here in laryngology and care of the professional voice. And we then were fortunate he stayed on the faculty to, to, until 2017. During that time, I had appreciated that David had certain skill sets that most surgeons don't have. So how do we anchor him to somebody, some place here at Vanderbilt in the ecosystem that can help him flourish? So he was linked up with Dr. Penson. David's now gone on to get um, NIH grants uh, especially looking at thyroid cancer and how to mitigate the risk of thyroid cancer. And he has well over hundred publications. So what about his mentor, Dr. Penson? So Dr. Penson, both these guys were my partners, David Francis as a faculty member and as a chair, Dr. Penson. So it's been a fun relationship. Dr. Penson has an MD, an MPH and an MMHC. So MD from BU, MPH from Yale, MMHC from here. He's chair of the Department of Urology, and he and I have talked that we're probably, urology and otolaryngology are probably the closest thing you can have to twin departments. We're very, very similar. And he holds the Hamilton and Howd Endowed Chair, and he has a role that was key for this for David Francis and for my interest, and he's really done a remarkable job with this. He's the director of the Center for Surgical Outcomes and Quality, here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. His training was at UCLA. He was on faculty at USC, also University of Washington, came here in 2009, which is exactly when I arrived. He has multiple NIH grants focusing on prostate cancer, not how to take it out, but how do you make decisions around prostate cancer? How do you think about surveillance and just watching it? How do you look at outcomes on prostate cancer? He publishes in the New England Journal. He publishes in JAMA. He publishes in Cancer. He publishes also in you know, art, uh, journals like Health Affairs. I gave up counting how many publications he has. It's around 400. So I had to stop uh, weighing his uh, CV electronically. So we're gonna start off with David Francis, who's gonna be telling us about 
thyroid cancer. David, you're on. Can you all see that? I need to do a sound check to make sure everyone can hear me. Thumbs up. Good. All right. So today I'm going to talk about something uh, that seems maybe basic, but is very complicated to understand. So um, this work has been a very interesting journey, and hopefully I'll be able to get some of that across to you as we uh, move through this. So to start with, I need to define it. Uh, first, I need to disclose the NIH stuff, but we'll keep moving. The, uh, the first thing I want to do is define what we're talking about today in terms of an, an, an analytic kind of approach. This is different than most people think about using big data. Most people think we're putting, we look at a big data set and we just kind of figure out what's significantly different, which has its issues and also has its benefits. But we're kind of taking this to the next level. What we're doing is called a discrete event micro simulation model. Discrete event means a system change in response to a sudden or discrete events, simulation using a computer to simulate the behavior of a system. And we're not just uh, simulating a system, we're simulating each individual person in the United States with this process. The problem we're studying really is this. Um, there's been a tremendous increase in the number of thyroid cancers over the last 20 to 30 years. In fact, it's about a seven-fold, eight-fold increase since the 90s. And the explanations are, are all over. Some people think it's overdiagnosed. Some people there's, think there's a real increase in the risk of cancer. Uh, and so there's some controversy here. But the fact of the matter is 80% of these are less than one centimeter cancers that are being found. And the obvious reason is that we're looking more. So um, this is a quote from our ultrasonographer here who said that she's seen two completely normal ultrasounds in the last year. But you can see there's been a collinear rise in the number of ultrasounds being done to look for cancer, thyroid cancer specifically. And what, why this is concerning is that there's a huge subclinical reservoir of thyroid cancer. This is a study we just finished looking at uh, the, the sub this is autopsy studies of people who died at these different age groups and how many of their autopsies had papillary thyroid cancer that was subclinical de detected. Basically what this shows about 10% of the population, no matter what age group has pap subclinical papillary thyroid cancer in, in their body right now. So, and the other interesting part about this is there's almost like a reverse uh, SES issue here that people who have better access to healthcare have uh, higher socioeconomic status uh, are people who are more likely to be diagnosed. Also women three times more than men and people who have more comorbidities are more likely to be diagnosed. So the questions really are why is this happening? And so our objective was to identify and quantify the number of cancers that would never cause symptoms or death if undetected. These are what we refer to as overdiagnosed cancers. It's like a, a four letter word, but uh, you know, then it's controversial, but that's what it is. So, so the healthcare system can focus resources on, on thyroid cancers that would result in morbidity if untreated. And our, our hypothesis is not just to simply say, yeah, it's more ultrasounds are being done, but why are more ultrasounds being done? So we're actually looking upstream. So the detection of subclinical thyroid cancer, we think is being driven by specific healthcare utilization and Im in imaging referral patterns. And this is where things get a little crazy. So most cancers that people look at this way are screened for, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, these types of cancer, breast cancer, these are all cancers that are screened for. So when people model these through NI, uh, NCI, they don't really look upstream because it's not really necessary because they're starting with the screen. The problem with thyroid cancer is that screening is actually recommended against because the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force found that the harms of screening are actually more than the benefits. So there's no standard way that patients enter the system. The concept that more ultrasounds is associated with more thyroid cancer diagnosis is not in question. However, what is less evident is how are they getting to the ultrasound? And this is where we're, this is where the crux of our study is. So uh, one thing that Dr. Evie taught me, he gave me a book called uh, Brokerage and Closure, 
that I read very carefully uh, when I was at Vandy was that we often are the content experts. And even for myself, who, who I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of biostats and study design and all these other things, is not expert in all things. And so if you really want to study something that hasn't been able to be answered, you need to look outside of yourself and outside of your expertise and find partners. And I was fortunate to have this person who I did my dog and pony show for over at the engineering school, who's a systems engineer and has been doing cancer modeling and breast for the last 20 years. And he, I convinced him to join forces and we have uh, gone on a journey. So what we're currently looking into are the following things. We are looking at the rates of current, uh, we, these are the current state knowledge gaps. So we have, we don't know how, what the rate of thyroid cancer over diagnosis, the rates that have been quoted in the, in the literature between 25 and 80%. We don't know how healthcare utilization affects overdiagnosis. We don't know what the harms of overdiagnosis are. And we have no method currently to study counterfactual scenarios. And I want to kind of underline counterfactual scenarios. That's a term that's often used in psychology, but not often used when we're talking about um, in otolaryngology, at least. So a counterfactual is the what if. So Counterfactuals are hard to study because often if you're trying to do a clinical trial, these are things that, you know, we don't, we can't do because you can't just not order ultrasounds on anyone. Uh, and then we can't ask the question in a study, what if we didn't order any ultrasounds for anyone without a palpable thyroid nodule? So studying counterfactuals is something you need a virtual laboratory to study. And that's what we're developing. And so the aims of our study really are three. First, we're developing this complex model. We're looking at uh, healthcare utilization upstream effects on what's increasing imaging, biopsies, and overdiagnosis. And then because the model gets complicated and there's a lot of assumptions, we have a huge stakeholder group that we meet with regularly to check ourselves, to check our biases, and to get feedback. Most of this work is modeled, is kind of similar to what's happening with CISNET. CISNET is a uh, NCI initiative in place since 2000 that uses advanced comparative modeling to improve understanding of cancer control interventions on population trends in incidence and mortality. This is, there is CISNET models in many big cancers, um, nothing in, in otolaryngology despite our best efforts so far. Um, but what we're doing is something similar and it creates this virtual laboratory that I was mentioning to conduct these synthetic experiments to look at different scenarios so that we can understand better what the population impact of different, different decisions would be. And so in order to do this, there's a lot of things that, are, that we kind of take for granted that we don't actually understand. So in order to understand estimates of overdiagnosis, we need to know, we need to understand the tumor growth, which is complicated. Uh, we need to know the reservoir of undetected cancers. We need to know what, what the patterns are in healthcare utilization referral patterns, differential use and, uh, and precision of the, of the imaging and testing that we're doing. So the simulation idea is we have to represent this event for every male and female in each age group in the US over all years. That's a lot of data. <laughs> um, and each probability in the simulation flowchart I'll show you is informed with either an observed input, meaning something we can measure or something we can't measure, which is an unobserved input. Examples of observable inputs include stage, size, specific instance, mortality, how many ultrasounds are, are being done by age and gender, the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound biopsies over the years, what, how small can ultrasound detect, and then other cause mortality. The trickier bit, at least in my brain when I'm trying to think through this, is there's unobservable things like when do cancers start? Uh, how many are benign versus malignant when the nodule onsets? Um, do to malignant tumors stop growing? Do they regress? These are things that we don't know the answer to, but we can look at and create and understand better using this model. And like I mentioned before, because these models get very complicated, we need a stakeholder group. The, this has never really been done in any of the models that have, that in, at least in cancer, um, because most of the models done through NCI are comparative models, meaning 
there are eight to 10 models around the country that compare their outcomes. When we're working within one model, we have to check ourselves by using a group of experts who are on the right side of the screen here that we carefully kind of figured out in terms of specialty, location, and other factors. So it's a multidisciplinary group. We meet with them a lot and they have many roles, but primarily they're to help us make sure we're making good decisions as we create this, this complex model. So getting back to this incidence curve that we showed earlier, the incidence curve obviously is going up, but each dot on that incidence curve represents a lot of people. And like I mentioned, we're going to model the whole United States, all the people. So each point on the instance curve represents millions of males and females. And so let's just follow one, one 40 year old female in 1985 and she does not have a thyroid nodule. So eat, this is kind of how the flow of this works. So every year there's a possibility she will die of another cause that is not related to thyroid cancer. Now, in younger age groups, it's probably small, but as the woman gets older, this other cause mortality will be important to decide whether she will die due to a non-thyroid cancer. Suppose she does not have a uh, thyroid nodule, uh, then we then check and initiate them uh, over time. So she goes through this process over and over again. So 40 year old, does she die of other causes? Does she have a thyroid nodule? Is a new nodule initiated at this stage? No and then we update her age. So we do this every year for every patient uh, over time in the United States for every age group. And then if she does have a nodule, is it palpable? Yes or no? And then is she referred for a diagnostic ultrasound? No, if it's no, then they update the nodule and they go back into that last slide I showed you. If yes, then she goes into a different thing. Is it detected with the diagnostic ultrasound? And then we get into treatment. Is it biopsied? Yes, no. Does she have surgery? What type, et cetera. And then it gets into the treatment kind of component of the model. And the model gets super, super complicated. This is not even the final model. This is just one example of what it might look like. So each person in the United States, male, female, every age group goes through this. So the first part of developing the model really is to create a longitudinal birth cohort. So we have patients, every patient in the United States is from 1920 to the present that we used as a run-in period. What that means is we have, we know for every age person, what the risk of death is for every year after 1920. So every age cohort. And that's kind of actuarial work, but that's something that's really important. And in order to do that, we use two large data sets called CDC Wonder, which is the human mortality database and the US census. So those two are critical for starting the process up. The next step in this process is to develop a natural history of, of papillary thyroid cancer growth. So what we did here is we have to create, because we don't know how every single cancer grows and what the distributions are for every person, we have to figure out a way to create this. This is the complexity of the model. And we used SEER as our, our calibration target. And what that means is that we create a scenarios of growth, and then we compare those growth rates against instance numbers and size data from SEER to see how they match up. And this is what we have so far for how well we can do in terms of predicting incidents per 100,000 individuals in the United States. This looks really good, but I wanna show you what's going on under the hood a little bit. This is what I have to stare at every Thursday morning when we have our lab meetings. So our PhD student and O's, uh, who's the other co-PI, give this to us every, every time. And basically in the overall, on the way left, this is the overall, which it's hard to read, but the predicted incidence is what our model versus SEER, which is the blue, looks really good for males and females overall. But what you'll notice, and especially focus on these two with the plus signs is that we underestimate in the youngest females and we overestimate in the oldest females. And we're still trying to figure out why that is. And some of that may be because we don't have all the data yet that we need to create the model, but some of it may be related to how cancers grow differently in older versus younger folks. 
Uh, it may, so that, or it could be the utilization differences between these groups. And so we're learning as we're creating this thing. Currently, we're, we're collecting data from Kaiser Permanente on uh, detection and healthcare utilization. And what examples of this would be how the ultrasound is utilized, diagnostic strategy changes over time, other imaging, et cetera. And the last portion of, the, of our model will involve treatment and survivorship, but we're currently focused here on detection and healthcare utilization. And we're using Kaiser Permanente Washington data because they have a very robust data source and it's clean, clean data. And we, uh, we have a great relationship with them and they provide us with lots of uh, data to do this work. So you, it's not something I would probably try at home. Um, we're using machine learning for the calibration portions. Uh, and without we, we, each run would take about 200, this is what my co-PI tells me, about 2,500 computer years. I've never thought about computer years in my life, but this, is, this would kind of run down your computer. That little circle on your screen would just keep going and going, and you'd probably shut it off. Um, so you need to have a pretty big um, computing power. And at Wisconsin, we have this thing called Condor, which is a great name, but basically what it means is that we, we, we can access all the kids' computers on campus uh, to run these models when they're not using their computers. And so we compare, once we've got the model completed, we compare it to representative large data sets. So there's, there's a great data set out of Kuma Hospital in Japan that we have, we have access to that have been tracking small cancers over time. And then we have uh, all claims, all payer data from uh, Wisconsin that we're also using as a validation target. So lessons from this research that we've gotten so far because it's still underway um, it make this kind of modeling work makes us think about cancer biology, epidemiology, and healthcare delivery in a new way. Each step of the way, you have to ask yourself: Do we have data on this? Why don't we have data on this? Who's published on this, etc.? It makes you challenge the assumptions of what is known when we walk stepwise through the process, and it identifies gaps in knowledge, like questions like what size nodules are palpable. That data is not really very good. Or what percent of nodules or cancers stop growing or regress? We don't know that. The other thing that's interesting about this is that there's a ton of interim work needed to do this work. Systematic reviews, um, database studies, et cetera. And the other thing I would say is it takes a village. We have so many different sub subspecialties and experts involved in this thing. The other thing that's gonna be interesting as we move forward is the model is a resource. So, what we're finding is that as people learn about the model we're developing, we're getting inquiries about extending clinical trials because when clinical trials end at five years, they don't know what the long-term outcomes are gonna be. We can actually pretty aggressively and, and accurately model those. We can also look and see if the narrowness of their inclusion criteria, what, what that means for generalizability to the general population. The other thing that's interesting is we also have gotten approached by evaluate for evaluating new therapeutics. So for example, if you have a new assay to help with diagnosis, that's something that can be in, in, incorporated into the model pretty easily. And we can look and see how that would impact uh, survival uh, and other factors that may come into play. There's also ability to look at cost effectiveness, health policy, guideline development, and projections. And the big picture policy implications of this are that this, these types of thing, which Dr. Penson is going to mention probably in the next uh, 20 minutes, these, these things do inform the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force guidelines and other big guideline recommendations from the organizations. They, we can estimate the effect of policy changes. Let's say they change the rules or they change how we approach these cancers or there's a new technology. We can evaluate those things. We can look at resource capacity for screening mandates and also evaluate and create in, uh, decision tools for both policymakers and also for patients and providers is based on this. So those are kind of the big picture features of what we're doing currently. Um, I would be remiss if I don't mention the team of people. Um, the, more, the, the more quote unquote senior I get, the more I feel like I'm a coordinator rather than actually doing all the work. And so I have this amazing group of people that are all over the country and the world that help me do this work. And so 
Uh, with that, I will uh, I will take questions, or I guess maybe we'll just switch over to Dr. Pensick. So we will take some questions now, and uh, which, is my voice project projecting? Okay. So, uh, David, could you go back to that slide, please, that showed the seven to eight fold increase, the blue dots going up? Sure. Because I think it took me a while to appreciate the red line on the bottom, which looks like mortality hasn't changed at all. Correct. Yeah. So this is why people are worried about overdiagnosis in thyroid cancer. There's a lot of other things thyroid cancer can do, but in terms of papillary thyroid cancer, the mortality rate's uh, close to zero and has remained that way uh, for as long as we've known about papillary thyroid cancer. Dr. Pence has his hand raised. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, and I may be misinformed of this. Someone had told me that there was a type of thyroid cancer which the pathologist agreed to change the uh, the nomenclature so it no longer had the uh, uh, word cancer in it. Is that true? Yeah, they, there was one one sub subcategory of papillary that they changed for to a non cancer. Yeah. And what does that do to your? What does that do to the models? Well, it doesn't really do much because there's not they're not included in the model oh, okay. the ear projections anymore. Um, and so one of the questions we have is what's happening at this end point here where it's kind of turning south uh, at the very end there. And we don't actually understand that and our model's also picking that up. And so we're trying to figure out why. And there may be less detection because of uh, guidelines or reclassification bias. But I don't think the reclassification bias is a big, is a big issue, but it's something we're definitely aware of. David, with all the push now with health equity, how do you look at that from with all these models? Yeah, it's really interesting. So um, good question. So we have, you just got to supplement to look at this for the first time. Um, um, even the big models um, have had a difficult time incorporating uh, race, uh, SES and other things into them. Um, it's because it's tricky to do that, but we're starting to work on that currently. Um, so in order to ha do that, you have to have uh, robust data on those features of folks. And they're, it's, hard, it's actually harder to come by than, we, than I think most people understand. And, 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 and Dr. Penson may have insight into that too, but we are, we are working on that, but it's true that this is an issue. And so we are looking at in a, in a largely insured population, but there are uninsured people in this. The only studies that have been done in this space to date have largely been done in Medicare, which also is um, kind of uh, artificial uh, in terms of its uh, grouping. So, cause most of these cancers happen in younger folks. So um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Um, there are, there are, there is diversity in our group and we also have the Wisconsin data. Um, so we do have a number of, uh, of kind of lower SES folks in there, but it's hard to study that way. David, another question on, do you have any data yet or are you gonna be looking at morbidity data? I'll give you an anecdote. Uh, somebody I trained with, I saw uh, years ago, I saw recently, he is the media person for a very large medical organization. His voice was bad. So I said, gee, what happened to your voice? He said, I had a thyroid nodule. They did an FNA, thyroid cancer, operated, vocal cord out, and P.S. in the sections of the thyroid, there was no cancer. So yeah, this yeah, this is a great question. So this is how I actually got into this because obviously I'm not a thyroid cancer surgeon, and um, there's people on this call who do a lot more thyroid cancer than I do. But what got me interested in this is exactly the morbidity piece, and this is why I'm so interested in the front matter here is because people are getting into the system depending on who they see for fatigue for voice complaints, for globus, which is like the bane of my existence forever and ever. Um, those types of things are causing people to get referred for ultrasound differentially, and then they're getting their thyroid removed. And then they always say things like, thank God they found it, even though they have vocal cord paralysis, which is a lifelong problem for them. So, so that is exactly why 
I got interested in this space in the first place. And so we should be able to show not only what the what percent of people are being overdiagnosed or estimate that, but what is the consequence of that for those, that population of people who probably didn't need to have their thyroid removed? Okay, thank you. We're gonna be switching now to David Penson. And for those of you who say, well, prostate cancer is kind of a field for what we deal with. Probably every male here at death, if your prostate was examined, would have prostate cancer. And if you're female, there's a good chance you'll be marrying somebody who at some point is gonna be getting PSA levels and uh, maybe biopsies. So this is a condition that is gonna affect you even though it's out, outside the scope of our particular specialty, it'll affect your life. So uh, David Penson, it's a treat and you're on, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me make sure I don't run too far over. So this, first of all, um, it, Dave Francis, that was a great talk. Uh, I had no idea you were doing CISNET type work. Um, it's a great thing. Uh, I, I'm always amazed at how career, you're starting to look a lot like me, except in head and neck, but not more beyond the, uh, the, the hairstyle. Um, I had the opportunity to work in CISNET um, before I came to uh, Vanderbilt um, when I was in Seattle and then when I was in Los Angeles. And um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's apropos um, the you know, Dave went first showing you the data in thyroid because CISNET has a lot of similar data in prostate. Now, I'm not going to show you data uh, or I'm going to minimize the amount of data I show you because um, I'm going to assume that most of you uh, are not going to be interested in the nuances of, you know, prostate cancer research. But what I really want to do is tell you a story about how these data, the stuff that Dave Francis is doing and, and, and others can really impact policy. And, and David, I, I noticed you had Rita Redberg uh, uh, on your stakeholder panel. Don't ask her about what she thinks about prostate cancer screening. Uh, it, not a good thing. Not a good thing. Um, I, when I was a, a fellow, I was a sort of a co-fellow with a guy named John Way, who's in Michigan now as a urologist. And John used to say, I can't deal with politics. I, I don't like politics. I just want to deal with the science. Just want to write the papers. And I used to say to him, oh, no, no, I love the politics. Um, but you can't do politics in healthcare without good data. So uh, I think that this is a story that I'm going to share with you about how you can use data to influence policy on a population level. You need to know one other thing before I get started was that I was the uh, policy chair for the American Urological Association from about eh, 2009, 2010 to about 2015 or 16, either vice chair or chair. And so I had the opportunity to sort of lead, a, a, you know, what is our specialty society uh, in a very uh, interesting time. So with that, I'll get started. Oops, where did I go? Where did I go here? There we go. So let's talk about the politics of prostate cancer screening. And it's actually not all that different than what you guys see with uh, thyroid. Um, I'll start by uh, making a point that I think Dr. Evie alluded to, which is that, you know, prostate cancer is, is, is really common. It is the uh, uh, most common solid tumor among uh, American men. It's the second leading cause of cancer death. But like thyroid, in fact, and the parallels are a little alarming, um, Prostate cancer is an, often an indolent disease that does not cause clinical symptoms and mortality. There's an expression in my business that more men die with prostate cancer than of it. I think some of you may be aware, um, you know, certainly in medical school, uh, they talk about PSA a lot as a test we shouldn't be doing. I'm not sure that's entirely fair, um, but there's an inexpensive and widely available blood test that can be used for early detection of prostate cancer. The test is sensitive, but it's not very specific. And frankly, many, but not all, and I think that's a key point of the cancers detected with PSA screening are clinically insignificant. So we get a lot of overdiagnosis here. Um, and I think the evidence, which I'm really not gonna go into in great detail, uh, uh, supporting screening is mixed. And for me, as someone who thinks about themselves as a public health advocate, you know, a lot of my journey in this area has been sort of balancing frankly, the Rita Redbergs and the, the nihilists of the world, the, um, often in primary care, and my colleagues in urology who basically want to take out every prostate they possibly can. And so, you know, you sort of walk this tightrope um, and the evidence is sometimes helpful, sometimes not. So primary care and PSA screening, I, 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 uh, I have great love for primary care physicians. Uh, I, I couldn't do it um, myself. It's 
be too much. I'm 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 one of those folks who uh very uh, small and specialized knowledge base. I like it that way. Primary care docs are busy. They got a lot on their plate. PSA screening is time consuming. Uh, if you really want to do it right, you got to explain the pros and cons. Interpreting the results of the test can be nuanced. Patients are anxious about prostate cancer. The word cancer freaks patients out. When they have an elevated PSA, they lose it. Um, and frankly, you got to understand in this game of healthcare health policy, there's limited resources. And so funding for PSA screening is going to detract from funding from other things like hypertension, diabetes, and disease that primary care docs care about. And so if you accept the argument, and I don't think you're going to have a, 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 a leg to stand on if you argue with me on this, funding for healthcare becomes a zero-sum game. We only have X amount of dollars. And so if you take from one pot, uh, if you're going to put something into one pot, you got to take it out of another. So I think when you look at USPSDF, which is a primary care uh, body, um, they're, they're not stupid. They know that if they spend a lot of time on prostate cancer screening, other things that they feel are more important are not going to get uh, taken care of. And they may be right, by the way. I think that's a key point. So let's talk about USPS, USPSDF and prostate cancer screening a little bit. What is USPSTF? The United States Preventive Services Task Force. It's been around for a long time, since 1984. Um, it's in HHS. Uh, originally, it was tasked to develop recommendations for primary care clinicians on appropriate content of periodic health, health examinations. So screening stuff, and it's composed of primary care docs. It was reconstituted in 1990 and is currently under the auspices of ARC, Although ARC, I was on the council for ARC. ARC kind of tries to stay at arm's length from this. And there's, I mean, USPSDF has an incredibly interesting history. The orthopedic surgeons tried to blow it up in the 90s um, uh, because they recommended against uh, uh, spine surgery. It's just a really fascinating uh, example of this sort of uh, crux, the intersection of politics and policy. And the members of uh, USPSTF are sort of either experts in preventive medicine or primary care. Urology for years would uh, nominate someone uh, to be on the panel. Um, I was nominated, a couple other folks who were doing these huge either prevention trials or had, you know, uh, HSR, or EPI training, and, and we were shot down continually, continuously. It was more for uh, uh, effect. We knew we were never going to get on there. Let's talk about USPSTF specifically around prostate cancer screening. Now, to their credit, they do try to follow the evidence, and Dave mentioned they use CISNET a lot. They refuse to use CISNET for PSA screening, at least not publicly. Privately, we got them to use it, but publicly, they won't use it. They'll use it for breast cancer, and I'm gonna, we're going to talk about breast cancer, too. In 2002, uh, they said they didn't have enough evidence, inconclusive. 2008, inconclusive again. 2012, they recommended against a grade D, and this was a big deal in my world, um, and I thought it was a little draconian. In 2018, they gave it a grade C, uh, which I think is the right answer. It discussed with the patient and personalized the decision. It's a lot of work to do it right, but I think you have to. So why does any of this matter? What do I care as a urologist about USPSTF? But, you know, there's a reason, actually, and it goes back to the Accountable Care Act or Obamacare. In 2012, there's a, a little phrase in the ACA that says any preventive service that receives an A or B grade from USPSDF must be covered by Medicare with no co-payment for the beneficiary. And they specifically say that cost sharing is allowed for services that receive a C, D, or I. And remember, private uh, payers follow Medicare, right? So the language is written, opens the door for private payers of Medicare to deny coverage for services with the C, D, or I grade on a case-by-case -case basis. And so... You know, it's a high stakes game. And I will tell you, as someone who was on the ARC Council when this bill was passed, this is not what ARC wanted. It's not what USPSDF wanted. Some staffer threw it in there. And let me tell you something, you know, USPSDF, I think, preferred to go under the radar for a long time. So uh, this is not, they don't like it any more than, than, than I do. All right, so let's just talk about the history here so you understand where we've been. And again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time you know, in 2002, uh, they had an evidence report and they had randomized clinical trials, observational and case control studies. The RCTs are cr were cruddy at this point. There was one from Canada, which kind of sucked. 
There were a couple of good case control studies, but for those of you who know, uh, you know, evidence grades, you know, case controls are not level one evidence. And there was a whole lot of observation ecological studies. So they gave it an eye and they're waiting for this big American clinical trial, the PLCO trial, which you may be uh, aware of because prostate is not the only one there, lung, colon, and ovarian are there as well. In 2008, they looked again, they look every few years. And in 2008, for men under age 75, they left it as an I. And now they found out there was a European trial, and these are huge trials. Um, and basically, um, they, uh, they said, we're going to get an answer in a few years. For men over age 75, they gave it a D. And, and I think that's reasonable. They, were, they looked at a study from uh, Scandinavia, a big uh, cl clinical trial that looked at guys uh, uh, with cancer who were randomized to watch waiting or surgery and men over age 75 had no survival advantage to getting surgery. So that made sense. You know, it's evidence-based. You know, there are still some urologists who had a hard time with that. And I was not one of them, but others did. And, and again, in my other role, dealing with my people, trying to talk them off the ledge, that was part of my role here as well. I will say that there wasn't much of a response to the USPSTF for our recommendation. And, you know, most of us agree there was a little benefit to screening and guys are less than a 10 year life expectancy. And let's face it, docs are no good at uh, estimating life expectancy. No one wants to sit in with the patient and say, listen, you're probably not gonna be alive in 10 years. So, you know, we wanna be optimist. But if you look at the 2008 recommendation, it, it's interesting because you see the politics, politics are everywhere here. The process was broken at that point. You know, they started to change which study designs they would let in. They manipulated the key questions. Um, they didn't even bother talking about the harms of overtreatment in the 2008 report, and I think they should have. Um, and they, again, they if you read the report, and I can remember reading at the time, basically saying, wow, if these trials uh, are even a little bit positive, they're still going to give it a D. They, it's got to be a slam dunk. Um, and so they kind of knew where they were going. And then in 2009, the trials came out. And I will tell you, I'm not going to show you the data from the trials because I didn't think that uh, you guys would be terribly interested in that. But the American trial, PLCO, was a negative study. Now, the American trial is flawed. And a lot of people have acknowledged that it's extremely contaminated. There's actually more PSA screening in the control arm than there is in the experimental arm. Uh, and that's factual. I'm not just saying that. So I, I tend to dismiss the American trial. The European trial was positive. But it wasn't strongly positive, and it was driven by its uh, eight centers, and it's more of a meta-analysis and trial because there were differences between the protocols amongst the eight centers. And it was really driven by two of the eight centers. Uh, the remaining six actually were uh, negative or you know, just a, a little bit positive, but two of them were strongly positive, and they were different screening protocols. And that goes to show you, to, in my mind, that one size doesn't fit all and you got to think this through a little bit. It's not that simple. But this is where what happened. And at this point, USPSTF immediately started their evidence review. Um, and they published their review ahead of their recommendation, which is really unusual. They never do that. They almost always put out the recommendation first and then they uh, follow it with the review. Why did they do it in this case? Again, more politics. This is all politics. At the same time they started that prostate cancer experience, they released new guidelines uh, for breast cancer screening. And this was a big deal. And these guidelines were based on CISNET data. So the stuff that David showed you, these models, they're critical. I mean, it is, they're the only way to answer these really difficult population-based questions. Um, and the models in CISNET for breast are good. The woman who runs it is a woman named Jeannie Mandelblatt, and she's a terrific uh, investigator. But if you allow uh, CISNET models or these sort of simulation models in one disease state, you sort of should be allowing them in all. And they don't use it in prostate because the models in prostate are much more favorable for screening. So what did they do? They initially recommended against routine screening uh, in women age 40 to 49. They gave it a C. They did give it a little wiggle room. Uh, they had biennial screening in women age 50 to 74, gave it a B. They recommended against uh, teaching breast self-examination. This is something USPSDF does a lot. Um, I, I think it's kind of, it's uh, you know, the reason they do it is because someone feels a lump, whether it's their breast, their thyroid, their testicle, and they call their PCP, and the PCP is darn busy. And then they uh, gave it an inconclusive for women over age 75. 
How did they decide against it? The, their own evidence review showed a benefit for screening in younger women, but they identified the following harms, false positive tests that happens and overdiagnosis. And so they did simulation modeling and the modeling basically was not favorable. So they recommended against, there was a vigorous response. I don't know how many of you remember this, this was a big deal, like national news, you know, Million Woman March. There were lots of publications that pointed out problems with the USPSTF science, and there were problems. They focused on incorrect numbers and assumptions. There were problems with the CISNET modeling studies. I mean, they're good studies, but all these studies require assumptions. And that's why it's so important, you know, if you're going to do these studies, you know, David was talking about how a stakeholder, as a stakeholder panel, you got to test your assumptions every day. I mean, there's no other way to do it. And the other thing here was that patient advocacy groups drove opposition. I mean, this was crazy. They expressed outre outrage. They went to elected officials. Um, the first woman to head NIH said lives could be at risk and urged women to ignore the guideline. How powerful is that when, you know, someone of that stature says something? And then uh, at that point, Kathleen Sibelius was the secretary of HHS. And she just said women should continue to get regular mammograms starting at age 40. So, uh, Secretary Sibelius is not a healthcare professional. She's uh, a politician. Um, uh, but that's an early um, example of what we're living in now, the pandemic, where politicians know more science than, uh, than the epidemiologists. So one month after release, uh, USPSTF unanimously voted to update their language regarding uh, the RAC in women under 50. Um, and they didn't change it, but they changed the verbiage. Decision to start regular biennial screening uh, should be individual. Um, you know, they were afraid that they were going to lose their funding and there were threats that there were. And again, I, we're going to talk about prostate cancer in a minute. Unfortunately, you know, this is part of the game and you got to be willing to play it. So now let's go back to prostate cancer with that background. In 2012, USPSTF gave uh, PSA screening a grade D. Why? Because they said the reduction of prostate cancer mortality 10 to 14 years after screening is very small, even for men in the optimal uh, range, 55 to 69. Hard to argue this, but I, I, it's true. The harms of screening are real um, and the harms of treatment are real. You know, just like David was talking about, you know, voice problems and uh, Ron was talking about voice problems. You have a prostatectomy, you're going to have all sorts of problems with sexual function, urinary function. You have radiation, you're going to have problems with sexual function, bowel function, and to a lesser degree, uh, urinary problems. So, you know, they looked at this and they said, you know what? The benefits of PSA screening do not outweigh the harms, which is uh, what uh, Dr. Francis implied before with thyroid. Now, that's kind of a judgment call, no two ways about it. And so that's why the politics come into play here. What are the harms of screening? You know, it's an imperfect test. Lots of false positives and negatives. Uh, biopsies are, are difficult. They, you know, a third of people have biopsies in one study had uh, adverse events, uh, grade two or higher. Um, about one in 50 to one in 100 require hospitalization. Uh, Overdiagnosis, that number there, 20 to 40 percent, uh, um, comes out of a CISNET model from Ruth Etzioni in, in Seattle. I, I was involved in that and was lucky to be involved in that. And Dave's right, it takes a village, and Ruth is a lot smarter than I am. And I mentioned all this. I mean, basically, screening's got a lot of harms. Why didn't USPSTF respond to opposition uh, to PSA recommendations? Because there were. Well, who was the most vocal opponent? It was my people. It was the AUA. And I didn't write this statement, um, and I learned from this statement, you never use terms like outrage and anger um, in Washington, at least you didn't 10 years ago. You might now. Um, it's a different time. But uh, we put this AUA is outraged and believes that the task force is doing men a great disservice um, by disparaging what is now the only widely available test for prostate cancer, a potentially devastating disease. Literally, we, because of that statement, we had, uh, um, you know, uh, elected officials who wouldn't take our meetings because they said, you guys are too, uh, too uh, uh, you're not objective here. And they were right, by the way. You know, if you look at the advocates, they did a bit. They said, we're disappointed with the recommendation. And they worked behind the scenes, which was good. So why did this recommendation stand? Prostate and breast are often compared when it comes to malignancies. Uh, there was a lack of a strong coordinated effort. There was a weaker media response. There was a lack of support from professional societies and the American Cancer Society. And here's the other piece. There was a perception that uh, urologists have a financial interest in the outcome and are conflicted. And I think that's true. You know, uh, here, I'll go back one. So these are my people. Love them. 
proud to be a urologist, but we're, you know, we, you know, uh, you have zero, which is a patient advocacy group. They work with these large urology group practices to do these mass screening events, not the right thing to do in prostate cancer. You can see that little sign, but it sure makes a lot of business for urologists. It's easy to draw the blood. It's harder to have a discussion. And a lot of urologists, particularly in community practice, the large groups, they now are buying radiation bulbs. And so there, if, if patient comes in, if they have surgery, they're collecting the pro fee. The radiation bulb, uh, uh, they're collecting pro fees and facility fees. And in fact, there was some concern that this was affecting uh, treatment patterns. And I think it was in some cases. So for me, as the policy person for urology at the time, one of my challenges was getting my people to come and be more reasonable too. So how did we manage organized urology? You know, in 2007, uh, we'd had a best practice panel statement that said we should start screening at age 40 based purely on opinion. Um, and in fact, they said we should have a lower threshold for biopsy in younger patients. In 2012, we produced an evidence-based guideline. I was involved in this, and this was something that almost didn't get passed by our board of directors. And it basically used the two trials that said, if you're going to screen, you need to start at age 50 to 55. You need to explain the pros and cons of screening. You shouldn't do mass screening. You should stop at age 70. And you should probably be thinking about biannual screening. Man, I got a lot of flack from my colleagues about this. I mean, a lot. I was at a national meeting um, and in front of about 3,000 people, uh, a well-known urologist turned around and told me I had the blood of American men on my hands. I wanted to tell him he had the urine of American men on his shoes but uh, I decided against that because I'm not that sort of guy. Um, but one of the things, so that guideline was critical because it really made, you know, was evidence-based. So again, but we then were able to use it politically and active surveillance, uh, which is what we do for low risk disease most of the time now was finally endorsed by the urologic community and that minimized um, uh, overdiagnosis. And it was included in the 2014 guidelines. So, just to quickly show you the impact of the 2012 recommendation, I mean, here you can see while incidence was going down on the left, it really took a big uh, dive in 2011, 2012. And you can see the adjusted screening rates here from 2010 to 2013. You see they're going down, you know, particularly in the younger men. And this has an effect not just on reducing overdiagnosis. Uh, and just to be clear, this is work from Dan Brokus here at Vanderbilt using the NCDB. First, he compared it to other cancers, and you can see that, you know, you, while there are some changes, it's not like prostate, which is the pink line here. You know, purple is uh, lung, blue is colon. They're maybe stable, maybe going down a little. Uh, breast going down maybe a little, but uh, not like prostate. And the thing was, was it wasn't just low-risk disease we were missing. We were missing high-risk disease. And actually, there's some discussion about men showing up with more metastatic disease. Um, in the end, it's not surprising. You screen less, you find less low risk, but you find less high risk too. My favorite slide in the whole deck. So from 2012 to 2018, there was a lot of back and forth. And um, in 2018, the USPSTF changed a the recommendation. They changed it to a C. And as I've said all along, that's good enough for me. Uh, I had little kids once, they're not little anymore. Um, but I, I think this is, it really is the right recommendation for this. And you got to see what that means. It means offer, provide the service for selected patients, depending on individual circumstances. So if you talk to patients, they can make informed decisions. And they may say, okay, I just want to know, but they have to understand they are opening a bit of a, a Pandora's box. You can put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, and I've done that. You know, patients come in and their PSA is a little elevated. And I say, well, you know, the next step, according to the book, is... Uh, you know, we do a biopsy, but honestly, the odds of us finding a bad cancer are pretty low. You want to check it again in six months? Yeah, Dave, that's a good idea. What were the reasons USPSDF changed a recommendation? Well, they looked at metastatic disease and they, uh, as an endpoint, and they basically said screening reduces metastatic disease. It may not help survival that much, but metastatic disease is reduced. They finally let go of the American trial because they said it was a bad trial. They didn't go and call it poor quality. They called it fair quality. And they noted it's the increased use of active surveillance in low-risk patients, which was a big deal uh, and a big change for urology. So what really happened? Well, I'm going to tell you that from 2013 to 2018, AUA and USPSTF were quietly talking behind the scenes. And particularly from 16 to 18, I was regularly talking to the chair of USPSTF 
sort of managing what they were doing and importantly trying to getting a head start so I can manage my people because they didn't want to get, you know, shellacked. You know, they were, they, they wanted to save face. And I thought that was important, but AUA did some funny things too. And funny appropriate, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows. We got, uh, no, it was bipartisan, but we got the HR 539, which was the U S PSDF transparency and accountability act which basically was not aimed at prostate cancer screening, but was really aimed at the, the task force. It needs to be more transparent. It was spearheaded by the AUA. I, I ended up sitting in the office of Marsha Blackburn. Um, and that's not consistent with my politics, by the way. Um, but she was a big advocate. So, okay, my wife uh, uh, is still annoyed at me about that. Um, uh, 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 and then when Trump was present, uh, they proposed to roll AHRQ into the NIH, which would have uh, dissolved the agency. ARC didn't want that. ARC had a prior history of this. And, you know, frankly, USPSDF was viewed as Obamacare and the GOP hates Obamacare. So frankly, AUA really, um, we leveraged it. I don't know a better way to put it, to move things along. But by the same token, it wasn't this adversarial, we hate one another. You know, when we sat down with the people from USPSDF, they were, you know, it was just a matter of managing messaging. So this is my last slide. What were the lessons that were learned here? And I think this is a great extension of what Dave showed you because you need to have data. I didn't bother showing you the prostate cancer data because I figured it would frankly bore you. Uh, it's not of interest to you as otolaryngologist, but we had some good data and it carries the day most of the time, not always. Um, enacting policy change takes great patience. You know, if you look, it was a seven, eight year process. And it's not over, by the way. You know, a USPSDF is going to look at it again. There's no new data. So I feel like they're not going to do much. And it's not going to get any better. But I think you've got to be patient if you get into this space, if you really want to make a difference and you can make a difference. Uh, you need to have evidence on your side, be balanced, and you need to be prepared to press political levers. You got to accept the fact that you're going to be meeting with people like Marsha Blackburn and hold your nose. And for those of you who are uh, uh, advocates of uh, Senator Blackburn, I'm sorry, just I don't share her politics. Uh, and I would say the most important thing, you know, as researchers, we have to do that. But if you really want to make a difference, you got to take that research and bring it to the table. So you got to stay true to your underlying principles and you want to do the right thing. So with that, I will stop. I will stop sharing my screen. I'll take any questions and uh, we can go from there. And I'm sorry, I ran David, over. David, thank you. I didn't even expect this. I mean, this was really insightful about how to get things done at, the, at a big picture level. I didn't know you were involved in a lot of this stuff. I knew the science end of it. I didn't realize the political end of it. Um, and, and thank you for your lessons learned on this, because I think David Francis now knows what he's going to be looking forward to in the future. I'll take, I'll take one question. Anybody on Zoom or in the room? Okay, we're a little bit over. David Penson, thank you. It's been a treat and a thrill, and we've really been elevated and illuminated by your experience. David Francis, thank you so much. We're proud of you. You were here, you're now there. Um, you've done great things. And I think the team, the two of you have been a fantastic team. And so uh, thank you both uh, very, very much. And we appreciate this. Thank you.